So hello, I am Rubin Skigneau, I am psychotherapist and teacher, body psychotherapist and teacher, and I am here with uh, old colleague uh, Michael Heller or Michel Heller, uh, as you like to call him because uh, he's, he's half Swiss, uh, half North America, is that correct? So basically I was trained in experimental psychology with Piaget, where the body was already a fundamental dim uh, dimension of intelligence. Yes. But he was only being cognitive. He was studying the development of cognition among children. And I decided I also wanted something on emotions and affects. And it so happened that there was Gerda Boysen in Geneva in those days. So I thought that would be a useful complement to have both, uh, uh, to be both a researcher and a psychotherapist always on the issue of how the organism, the body, and the mind, and the physiology, and communication relate with each other. And so I first started in classical Piagetian experimental psychology and learning the, the body psychotherapy with Gerda Boysen and her team. And her team was very important in those days already. Yes, yes. And, uh, then I switched my research area to nonverbal communication, which is what I did my PhD thesis on, on posture. And I continued my research career then, working in Geneva psychiatrical institutions to study, uh, to see if one could predict suicidal behavior mm. by observing the nonverbal communication of the patients. And I found things. It hasn't been replicated, but I found things Good. that could also be seen on the therapist. That was the interesting part, mm -hmm. is the therapist, without knowing it, changed his uh, communication style in function of the suicidal risk of the patients. And at the same time, I continued uh, seeing patients in biodynamic psychology, making conferences, writing, participating in the structuration of the body psychotherapy field and developing my personal theory. You know one thing that is interesting, the, the theme of my, my PhD mm -hmm. was sense development yeah. in nonverbal communication mm -hmm. in, in the nonverbal stage of life. Yeah. And um, so it, it's kind of our PhDs are, are, are at least the name are similar, the titles yeah. are similar. Yeah. So Michael, I wonder now uh, what, what what do you think about psychotherapy or body psychotherapy nowadays for you, now, today, you know? Mm -hmm. Because after we did so many things, uh, so many experiments, mm -hmm. so many trainings, uh, we even had have this uh, similarity that we did biodynamic, etc. So how do you see, what's, by the, by, what's psychotherapy or body psychotherapy today? How, how is that for you? Well, there's two things. Is A, I first remained a psychologist. Hmm. And for me, psychotherapy, a bit like Pierre Janet, is the application of psychology. Okay. And uh, psychology is a new science in terms of history. It's only 100 years old, basically. Yes. And it has everything to learn. So basically, we have what I call placebo theories, where the psychotherapist thinks he knows or hopes he knows, or he needs concepts he can use, but that doesn't mean they're really correct. And we try and learn from that basis through practice onwards. So for me, there's no really good psychotherapeutic uh, theory in any sense. Uh, but uh, the field is advancing. The field is discovering new ways of doing things uh, every day. And uh, um, maybe body psychotherapy for me is has two aspects to it. It's among all the psychotherapists who believe that the mind is embodied, that is, in, a, in the way, the same way as Lamarck, that the, the body is part of, the, the mind is part of the organism. Uh, uh, the mind is not a soul, the mind is not uh, something in opposition to physiology, it's some of the cogwheels of the organism. Mm. And the mind is not a united thing. It's very many highly varied, sometimes antagonist forms of cogwheels. Some are more or less automatic, some are more or less uh, felt and experienced. Uh, it's a high variety of mechanisms. And in this sense, body psychotherapy is the expertise to, uh, 
how, how would I say that, is the expertise to use body techniques, I mean physical body techniques, like breathing, massage, uh, observing muscles, posture, nonverbal communication, and seeing how it links to the mind, to the dreams, to the fantasies, and realizing that whatever way we approach the mind through behavior, through nonverbal communication, through massage, through breathing, we can discover new aspects of the mind. So that would be about... Yes, but, but you're talking about the mind, but if, if we talk about a person, if we, yeah. are, if we are with our patients, mm -hmm. in front of our patients, of course, and then, for example, I can remember a patient of mine, you know, that is uh, a man, uh, a man of 70 years old mm -hmm. already, uh, uh, professionally very mm -hmm. well, that's not, the po that's not the point and not the problem. But for example, that man uh, is um, very brainy. He's too much in his in his mind, mm -hmm. and uh, he had he has had lots of problems in his development. So so that so that uh, he he cannot. It's very difficult for him to take care of his body uh, in a very mm -hmm. simple way of saying. Mm -hmm. you no. Know? So for some time, I'm working with him how he can take care of him. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he has to have somebody to take care of him, of his body, because mm -hmm. it's hard for him, uh, this connection mm -hmm. of taking care of the body, you know. Um, so, well, what do you think about that? How? Well, I mean, we have that a lot. Yes. I mean, you know, in our jobs. Yeah. <coughs> I have cases like that too. Yes. And my, my conceptualization is the whole person is the organism, in it, you have a variety of psychological dynamics, and the body for me is only the physical body, and in between you have what we call body sensations. And there obviously are people where the connections are highly varied. Some people have very, they never listen to their body, they, their physical body, or they never listen to body sensations, or vegetative sensations. You can use whatever word you, you want. Uh, but they are sort of disconnected. They don't listen to when they're tired. They don't listen to when they need uh, to have fun. They don't. They don't listen. They just have sort of uh, obsessional plans of what they should do and not do. Mm. And then, of course, teaching them to 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 enrich the connections within the organisms, and and teaching them to enrich how the mind inserts itself in the organism and all its parts is an important part of body psychotherapy for yeah, me. Yeah. Another, another thing that nowadays are uh, uh, calling my attention, of course, I, probably yours too, is the question of technology. No? Mm -hmm. How technology puts people away from the body. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of, you are kind of, uh, not a slave, but you depend so much in technology nowadays, in, in, in normal life, mm -hmm. many people do. Many people do that. I think you feel that in, in your patients too. They depend on mobile phones, they depend on computers, they, they depend on this kind of visual mm -hmm. communication mm -hmm. all the time, you know. And uh, that creates a kind of energy, you know, that uh, puts people away from, from their own bodies, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, at the same time, at the same time, uh, the little screen is kind of extension of his body mm -hmm. to whatever he wants in the mm -hmm. world, you know. Yeah. So, and uh, that that's that's becoming a problem in several several cities because it's happening in what we call the withdraw the withdraw situation. It means people are always withdraw from each other, you mm -hmm. know, from touching, from being there, mm -hmm. from looking in the eyes, from being together, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, we are we are developing uh, in the University of São Paulo, you know, a special uh, place just to deal with this problem mm -hmm. with the students mm -hmm. from the university, you see. But I remember when I was in Sao Paulo to see you, you brought me to a very beautiful exhibition of uh, electronic art. Yes, yes. I yes. think your son was part of that My exhibition. Daughter. Or your oh, daughter. Yes, 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 yes. So it could be very creative. I think the real issue is, I mean, you know, people of my age keep saying, oh, it was better before the machines or something like that. Yeah. But the real problem um, was already mentioned by Lamarck in 1802 in a quote that you can find on my website where he says that civilization is continuously developing new technologies, 
new ways of doing things which influence our thinking without one realizing it. Ooh. And so, for example, a big problem in Lamarck's days was the first novels. And that was considered as masturbation. It was very immoral to read models for young girls because they were isolating themselves. Like today, we have young people isolating themselves around a machine. They were isolating themselves around a machine, I mean, uh, around a book, a printed book. And I think, and also when you think of all the morals that existed in 1802 about politeness, what you should do, what you should not do, there were also ways of splitting yourself. Mm. So that the tendency <clears throat> to split oneself in function of the latest fad or the latest mode and so on there was is, a, is it eternal. It was always there. Yes. It was always there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, today would they use machines? so as not to develop, for example, nonverbal communication with other people. You know, spontaneous, how do you talk with people, how do you have fun with people? Well, no, they have fun with their machines. I have patients, they arrive in my practice, and I say, hello, and they just go on their phone, hello, how are you? And they go and sit and wait until I call them. But, you know, th there's always been fads like that. Yeah, well, that's, well, that, that can be It can be uh, a medicine, mm -hmm. uh, as I say. I said it can be a medicine mm -hmm. against depression too, mm -hmm. somehow. Also, because yes. because it puts people in activity, yeah. and depression takes people away from activity. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are the good side. There is the good mm -hmm. side, and uh, and also there is the side where where people become stay only there. You know, yeah, yeah. and then and then they have lots of difficulties mm -hmm. to make. Uh, contact with other humans, no? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But splitting devices, you and know, you had cigarettes, you had coffee, yeah. you had uh, hash, you yeah. had... Uh, you always have ways... The, the problem is, I can see people, you know, they spend hours, even close friends, you know, clicking on a card game or on a demineur yeah. or on porno films or anything. They, they need to disconnect themselves in what, for example, Pierre Janet already taught, automatic behaviors. And any automatic behavior, even reading the newspapers or anything, can be a way of sort of locking yourself in a place where you don't feel your anxieties, but where you're not uh, creative at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in Switzerland, you live in Lausanne, and uh, you have probably have patients from Switzerland and maybe from other countries in Europe too. But uh, what do you see? Do you see some main problem coming to you? Some, some similar prob problems into people or not so much? Well, you know, I don't believe so much that there are psychological problems which are specific from, from a country. Or from a time. But for example, When I was living in Geneva I w and, and working also a bit in Lausanne, I noticed the dreams were very different. In Geneva, all the water dreams were something closing in, because that's what the river is doing in Geneva. Mm. And when I was working in Lausanne, water dreams were always sunny and open. So there are influences of, of the environment. And then there's the fact that, uh, I don't know why, but somehow patients with a certain problem come all together in my practice. So for example, right now, the two problems I have most is burnout. And because also the word has become fashionable. Mm. Like in, in some years, before when you always said everybody was hysteric, now everybody yeah. has a burnout. And, and how they become burnout? And well, let me just finish. Yeah. And the second problem, which I find more interesting, is somehow I have a lot of mothers who in modern Switzerland hospitals have suffered very difficult and painful childbirth. Yeah. And I got a whole series of those cases lately. From childbirth? From childbirth Being in the hospital. Burnout by childbirth? No, no, not burnout. That's an other issue. Okay. There's burnout on the one hand, which is somehow invading my practice, and another problem, which where I have many cases, all females, is about childbirth. Is about childbirth pain which is still badly managed in hospitals in Switzerland. Okay, that's very interesting, yes. In Brazil too. In Brazil, in fact, we have, uh, we have another very big problem with childbirth mm -hmm. because 
most places they want to do caesareas because mm -hmm. it's easier for the doctors, for the mm -hmm. hospitals, etc. And uh, and uh, then the, the women are losing, mm -hmm. you know, the the quality mm -hmm. and the capacity of giving birth in a natural way and being and be well uh, directed, well oriented yeah. to have a good child mm -hmm. in birth. And and the bar burnouts and. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, can, do you have an example of burnout? I mean, well, uh, usually there are people who have been in a mis, who have been mismanaged at their work, and who suddenly are depressed, anxious, incompetent, stressed. Uh, uh, often have physical symptoms as well as psychological symptoms, mm -hmm. which is usually the case with stress in general and that can do no more and that are kicked out of their job because of that because the the boss doesn't want to pay for that and what happens today is if somebody is ill in the office well he's never replaced so that the other people in in the in up till about 10 years ago when somebody was ill you found somebody to replace the person so there was no real additional stress to the teamwork except that you had to explain to the new person you know what to do, which is already more work. But now they're not replaced. So the and sometimes you have two people who have a burnout in a five people team. So you have three people doing the work of five people. Yes. And they're not replaced. And so then they get a burnout. And yes. sort they everything's organized by modern economy. This is an economical problem that influences what happens what we see in psychotherapy. Everything is done so that people get in a burnout like this, the government, the, the, the society, the taxpayer pays for the treatment of the person. Uh, the, the, the office has nothing to pay yeah. and then they get uh, a younger or a newer person. So, so would you say that uh, psychotherapy <coughs> today would be distress, distress people feel, either, for example, mm -hmm. let's take the two examples. Either from childbirth, either either from the burnout situations, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and then we have we help people to distress this stress somehow, mm -hmm. and uh, I wonder they get into themselves, right? Yeah. And many times to get into oneself, you know, uh, that's the second problem, isn't mm -hmm. it? <laughs> Well, actually, I to see three find, problems. To find that pl that place, you know. One is to distress. Yes. One is to get into contact with what you really want to do in life. Let's put it this way. Yeah. And what you really but, feel in but a way. That, that would be connected with your identity, right? Exactly. Okay. And third thing is what Reich. That's one aspect of Reich I still have kept, is to re-empower the person by showing to the person the social problems that created the problem in the first place. Uh, I'm not the problem. Like, you know, I had a guy, he had a burnout and he had an alcoholic father. So he could say, I, I'm more fragile than most people because I have an alcoholic father. Mm -hmm. And we worked on that. I mean, it is a problem to have an alcoholic father. Yes. But uh, we also, I also tried to, to explain to the patient that the alcoholic father is not the only problem. The, the way he was managed, the way, you know, there's an increasing number of psychopathic managers that really treat people with no respect and refuse to allow a person to have time to respect themselves. And uh, actually, I have some psychopathic managers in therapy right now. Yes. So yes. They, they, they exist, you know. No, they exist. They sure. exist. Sure. So that it's, it's important that for the for the next steps in, in the life of the patient to improve his way of defending himself and situating himself in the world as it exists today because for his life or her life we can't change the world in one year you know no. that he gets a sort of awareness of the situation where he can find his own political vision or his own uh, way of reanalyzing how he wants to defend himself in this world that's also without, an important without part. being a psychopath, right? Yes. Because the kind of psychopaths, uh, let's make it a bit more clear, they manipulate the environment as they want, uh, yeah. for where they want, but uh, they, 
<clears throat> the price they pay is that they, they get out from who they are, in fact, you know, in, in the, the deep side of the identity of them. So when they come back to that identity, so I think that's that part of the psychotherapy is mm -hmm. very profound and it should be very respectful and uh, deep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Okay. I think that's enough. <laughs> okay.